Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to Cosmos from Your Couch. My name is Michael Reed, and I'm a professor in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto, and the Public Outreach Coordinator for the Dunlap Institute. Uh, I have the very great pleasure this evening of introducing one of my colleagues who's going to be giving this evening's presentation. Um, just before I introduce him, a couple of uh, little logistical things. We will be entertaining questions today, um, but we're going to reserve those for the end of tonight's talk. So if you'd like to share your questions, please post, put them in the uh, chat window on YouTube. And um, you can do that whenever you like all throughout the talk and we'll compile all of them and send them to uh, Dr. Percy uh, toward the end. So. Uh, tonight's topic is archaeoastronomy, uh, presented by my colleague, Dr. Percy, Dr. John Percy. Uh, I'd like to introduce him. So he's a professor emeritus of astronomy, astrophysics, and science education at the University of Toronto, where he has taught uh, since 1967. He formally retired in 2007, uh, but he's probably the most uh, active professor emeritus you'll ever encounter. His astronomy research interests include variable stars and the evolution of stars. He's published over 250 research papers in these fields and authored the book, Understanding Variable Stars. Uh, he's known throughout the world for being very active in science education, particularly astronomy uh, at all levels. His interests in education include uh, the development of teaching at the university level, the development of the space and astronomy curriculum in Ontario schools where we're located, uh, teaching pre-service and in-service teachers, lifelong learning, public science literacy, science centers, planetarium, citizen science, and many others. Uh, he has received a huge number of honors in his life. Uh, he's been the president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the Royal Canadian Institute, and the American Institute of Variable Star Observers. Uh, his awards include the Royal Canadian Institute Sanford Fleming Medal for contributions to the public awareness and appreciation of science and technology. And he's also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, in 2006, he was the inaugural recipient of the University of Toronto's President's Teaching Award, and I think you're going to uh, really enjoy hearing from him this evening. So I will turn things over to Dr. Percy. Uh, again, feel free to ask questions in the chat room on YouTube, and we'll uh, get back, we'll get to those right at the end. So uh, take it away, John. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, as Mike said, I'm a Professor Emeritus, a rather active one. Uh, I've been an astronomer for 58 years now, so I kind of qualify as an archaeological specimen. But this is actually the first time I've given a presentation to an invisible audience, and so bear with me. So uh, up we go. If you've been following this series of Cosmos from your couch, you'll have noticed that almost all of the talks are about the frontier research that goes on in places like the Dunlap Institute. So on the left side of this picture here is a very famous image. Uh, it's a time exposure of a tiny fraction of the universe. And with the exception of one object, all of these objects here are galaxies of hundreds of billions of stars. And the very smallest, faintest ones are so far away that it's taken their light billions of years to get to us. So we're actually seeing them as they were billions of years ago and looking back in time. Now on the right hand side, uh, we see the famous Stonehenge monument. That goes back about 5,000 years, perhaps a bit more. We suspect that it has astronomical significance, but I assure you that figuring out what Stonehenge is all about is every bit as complicated as figuring out the uh, evolution of those galaxies that we see on the left-hand picture. Uh, so first of all, a caveat, uh, I am not an archeologist. I'm not even an archeoastronomer. I just happen to be interested in how astronomy connects with other disciplines, whether it's science disciplines or the arts or the humanities or whatever. The other thing I should say about this picture is that the guy on the right hand side there and I are graying white males. And I don't want you to think that astronomy is only done by graying white males. And to illustrate that, I show you a picture of my colleagues in the Dunlap Institute a couple of years ago. And uh, we are a very diverse bunch as astronomers are these days. 
So I want to start by getting you to think about astronomy and what that term means to you. So if you've been following this series, you probably think it's all about new discoveries about the universe, space exploration, cosmology, et cetera. But there's all these other aspects to it. There's simply the night sky and the constellations of stars, which many, many people enjoy looking at, particularly amateur astronomers. There's the very practical matter of how the motions of the sun and the sky produce day and night seasons and help us to find north and south and east and west. There are for many people the question of whether the position and motion of the sun, moon, planets and stars might affect them, i.e. astrology. That doesn't work scientifically, but many people believe in it. And other than the placebo effect, uh, it has no scientific basis. And furthermore, in terms of the wide application of astronomy, uh, the way it applies to religions, their calendars, their festivals, their rituals, the alignment of their churches and other monuments is something that really does affect uh, literally billions of people around the world. So I want us to take this broader uh, ideas to what astronomy is as we go through the presentation tonight. Uh, so we begin then with a definition. If you look up astronomy in the dictionary now, it's defined as the study of the universe, but archaeoastronomy somehow implies that that's what society's pre-technology were doing with the sky, and that's uh, almost certainly not the case. So we define archaeoastronomy, or at least Rolf Sinclair did in uh, Wikipedia, as the study of how people in the past have used and understood phenomena in the sky and what role the sky played in their culture. Now, the name, in fact, the whole field of archaeoastronomy is debated and somewhat controversial. Uh, this particular slide by Gary Larson, the original word that that poor guy in the middle was going to get was Australopithecus. And I think you'll agree that archaeoastronomy is almost as much of a mouthful. Uh, you could possibly call it cultural astronomy, but there's a bit more to cultural astronomy th than that. But we'll go with archaeoastronomy for the time being. So I keep using this word cultural. And so I've got a list here of what you might consider the sky to be as a cultural resource. Well, it provides light by day and night. Uh, it tells us the time of day, sunrise, noon, sunset. It tells us the time of the year, if you know how to do it, uh, using some form of calendar. And there's many ways you can do it. Uh, navigation, either on land or at sea. And I'll give you some examples. And this business of spirituality, whether somehow you think that your gods are up there in the sky, or you simply use the sky to establish a calendar of your rituals. This question of astrology, which is widely believed, and we have to accept that. And the question of where we came from and uh, the stories of creation and other cultural stories in the sky. So a huge amount of stuff there and all of it's interesting. And, all of it is touched on by this field of archaeoastronomy. Now, one of the things that I'm interested in, as Mike said in the introduction, was astronomy in the schools. And we have in Ontario got it into grade one, six, nine, and 12. But in fact, there's many other places in the curriculum where you could connect astronomy. So there are places in the curriculum where kids learn about these great civilizations, both in the old world and in the new world. And all of these had astronomy as a significant part of them. And I would hope that that was taught as part of any discussion of these uh, many civilizations around the world, uh, some of which we'll touch on this evening. So you may remember or have heard this story of the seven blind men and the elephant. Apparently it goes back many centuries and comes from somewhere in India. So the idea is that if you have seven blind men and they each encounter a different part of an elephant, they might think that the elephant is a spear, a fan, a snake, a tree, a wall, a rope, just because they're limited in what parts of the elephant they're actually sampling. Now, if they were to take off their blindfolds, of course, or if they were to talk to each other, they'd have a much more holistic view of what an elephant was. And in a way, it's similar in archaeoastronomy because 
if you really want to make sense of this, it has to be done in an interdisciplinary way. Certainly we need the archeologists because much of what we know about these cultures is based on artifacts, on buildings, on burials, on grave goods and things like that. Uh, we need people who understand about cultures, anthropologists, ethnologists and so forth, um, not just for the cultures, but uh, having some oral history uh, ideas as to uh, present day practices, for instance, reports of the colonizers who had a huge influence on, for instance, New World ar archaeoastronomy. Uh, we need the written history of science in many cases. There's lots of scholars and authors, of course, whose work uh, goes back many thousands of years to different civilizations around the world. And by definition, we need the astronomers to uh, at least do something useful here. And as you will see, uh, we also need statistics and probability in some cases. Now, in the, uh, in, in the blurb for this particular talk, I quoted Clive Ruggles, who said that this is a field with academic work of high quality at one end, but uncontrolled speculation bordering on lunacy at the other. We will see some examples. And the lunacy isn't necessarily uh, people who are amateurs in the field. And uh, one example is the work of uh, Gerald Hawkins, who was an astronomer, who wrote this famous book called Stonehenge Decoded, in which he claimed that within Stonehenge, there are dozens of alignments uh, between the stones that point to rising and setting points on the horizon and even the possibility of using some parts of Stonehenge as a computer to predict eclipses. Now, most of that is no longer accepted, but it at least did have the advantage of popularizing this field for many people. And certainly I read that book when I was much, much younger and uh, maybe a little bit more naive. And I say at the bottom here, we also have to be very careful of experts within narrow disciplines who don't do the thing uh, about uh, learning about the elephant by actually uh, consulting other people. So a little aside here, I wonder if it would help us in this and other fields if our education system were a little bit more liberal, a little bit more multidisciplinary and a bit more culturally broad, uh, especially in a place like Canada where we need to be aware of different cultures and their history and uh, also in terms of this discipline, it really helps to have an understanding at a basic level of other disciplines as well. So I wanna start with something very simple that you probably know about. This is really the basis for uh, archaeoastronomy uh, as a, a practical tool. So you all know that the sun rises in the east and goes up in the south and then sets in the west. And when it's highest in the sky, that is noon and that is south, at least for us Northern observers. Furthermore, the rising and setting points of the sun change during the year. In the winter, the sun rises far south of east and sets far south of west, and it's only above the horizon for maybe eight hours. Whereas in the first day of summer, the sun is rising far to the north of east, going high in the sky and then setting to the north of west, uh, maybe about 16 hours later. That, by the way, explains the seasonal changes in temperature. It has nothing to do with the earth getting closer to the sun. Uh, it's just that we have more hours of daylight in the summer and the sun is higher in the sky. But you immediately see how by observing these phenomena, we can use the sky as a clock, compass, and calendar. And that would have been a very powerful technology for uh, pre-technological cultures, at least in our sense. So you're all familiar with the sky clock. We call it a sundial. Um, that's a very fancy way of thinking about it. If you were a girl guide or a boy scout, you probably knew how to find the pole star, the North star by using the end stars of the bowl of the Big Dipper. Uh, you may not know also that the angle of Polaris above the North Point is approximately equal to your latitude. And so uh, this can be used for navigation uh, as well. And in terms of navigation, um, perhaps the most remarkable practitioners were the Polynesians who managed to navigate between islands over great long distances in the Pacific Ocean. 
uh, they use not only the sky, but um, everything else in nature, the ocean currents, the clouds, the uh, sight of birds, things floating in the water and so forth. And uh, they knew how to do this. Um, they were able to cross at least half the Pacific, maybe the whole of the Pacific. And still today, some of that knowledge is being handed down to young people rather than being uh, perpetually lost. Another aspect of the sky calendar, and this is a bit of a complicated diagram, but if you think of Earth as being in the center of the universe and the sun appearing to go around the Earth each year uh, as the Earth goes around the sun, that means that throughout the year we see the sun in different constellations of the zodiac, 13 in fact. And uh, also, if you think about what constellation is opposite the sun in the zodiac, that's going to be the constellation that you see at midnight. And so the midnight constellations change throughout the year. And you can use their visibility of another way of keeping track of the seasons and when you should do your planting and when you should do your hunting and so forth. This is a bit of a complicated diagram here, but uh, here we're looking at the sky from outside and uh, imagine the sun on the first day of summer going up in the sky like this, setting to the north of west, whereas on the first day of winter, it uh, rises to the uh, south of east, goes up very shallow in the sky and sets to the south of west, um, giving you either longer days or shorter days here. The other thing you'll notice, and this is what we'll pick up a little bit later on, is the fact that the rising and setting point of the sun changes during the year uh, from southwest here to uh, northwest as you go from the first day of winter to the first day of summer. So if you were able to observe the sun's rising or setting point, you could tell where during the uh, year you were. So I want to start with thinking about the origins of astronomy and remind you that everything on Earth has a cosmic origin. We are all star stuff. And life has developed on our planet over 4 billion years. And all the life that we share our planet with is related to us in the sense that we have a common biological history as well as uh, history in the other sense. It's one world, one sky. You don't see any political divisions on this uh, picture of the Earth taken from space. Now, you may know that uh, some species on the Earth, butters, flies, birds, turtles, dolphins, and so forth, turtles, are known to uh, make long voyages of migration from one part of the Earth where they might go to feed to another part of the Earth where they go to breed. And people have always been very puzzled as to how they could do this. And there is some evidence that they use either the Earth's magnetic field or the sight of the sun or possibly stars. There have been some interesting experiments in planetariums to test this kind of thing. So the question is, is this valid? Is it purpose purposeful? Uh, could this be defined as the first astronomy? Uh, the oldest astronomy that there's any credible evidence for, and even here it's rather nebulous, uh, are things like this uh, supposed moon calendar that you see on the left here, uh, which may be a tally of uh, the appearance of the moon and its phases over the course of months. Problem is that whoever made this is not around to tell us, and they didn't leave any uh, instruction manuals behind. So we can only guess on the basis of knowing uh, what their needs would be and the fact that uh, astronomy seems to have been of use to uh, virtually all cultures. Uh, there is suggestion that astronomy goes back maybe 70,000 years uh, to people who har harvested shellfish uh, in, in the oceans because uh, the moon affects the tides and the tides affect uh, when you can go out and harvest fish or shellfish or whatever you're going to do. And then there's this famous cave in France, the Lasso Cave, um, roughly uh, 18,000 years ago. And there are various things on the wall in there that some people interpret as being the positions of particular stars that would have been visible and important to whoever did this. 
uh, I find this very interesting, perhaps plausible, and definitely unproven because again, the artists who did this sort of thing are not around to, uh, to actually show us, but it does seem plausible. And that brings us to a, a, another aspect of astronomy, which no doubt must have started at some point, and that is people's questioning of what it was that uh, determined our origins, our, the meaning of our life, um, the determinants of our future. And a lot of this is connected with belief in certain gods, and uh, the gods were connected with the sky for various reasons. I won't go into planetary motions, but it's not surprising that given the red color of Mars, it was associated with the god of war, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you had these planets that were moving around the sky, then you might suppose that somehow they could tell us about life and to what our future was going to be. And hence the development of various astrologies among different cultures, whether in the Middle East or in China or in India or whatever. And um, that could be a talk in its own right. So one example of this, and this is one of the uh, great monuments of, um, of the old world, uh, is the Sphinx of Giza and also the pyramids that you see in the background. And we know that uh, these were associated with the sun because a primary deity, at least at various times in Egyptian history, um, uh, were uh, important to them. So we find that the pyramids and the Sphinx itself are oriented in an east-west direction, presumably uh, representing some kind of belief that uh, the east is where uh, the sun, and therefore the gods went, and uh, that was perhaps a window on the afterlife. And uh, you're aware that the Egyptians gave great attention to the afterlife, both in the uh, tombs within the pyramids and the huge effort of building the pyramids themselves. So it was obviously important. And I point out at the end, the obvious thing that the word heavens has two different connotations. It's where the gods are. And we refer to the heavens as simply the sky above. There's all sorts of interesting um, places in the British Isles. Uh, with astro astronomical significance. One of the most interesting is Newgrange. So this is looking back 5,000 years to this uh, passage burial chamber in, in Ireland, where on the date of the winter solstice, the sun can shine through uh, something that appears to be a purpose-built shaft. That is, this was constructed so uh, the sun would uh, do that at a particular time. And it makes it a little bit more believable because this is not the only structure of its kind. And whether it's a burial chamber like this or Stonehenge, uh, a monument, um, they all seem to have these astronomical alignments to them uh, for whatever reason. Well, that brings us to Stonehenge itself. Uh, this was what Gerald Hawkins uh, uh, found all the possible astro astronomical alignments. Uh, I remind you that it's huge technology, it, well, it's huge effort to uh, put up these stones here because they weigh upwards of 40 tons, but it can be done with the efforts of 100 people or so, uh, probably not as much effort as building the pyramids. So certainly the basic alignment of Stonehenge does point to uh, a winter solstice uh, setting for the sun. The other alignments are very, very unconvincing actually, but it's the basic alignment to the sun's uh, setting point, which uh, seems the most interesting because Stonehenge is not alone on the plains uh, of uh, Wiltshire there. Uh, there are many other structures, burials and so forth around it, which is gradually leading archeologists to the notion that Stonehenge is part of this vast shrine for the dead uh, where people congregate by the thousands about once a year, perhaps to honor uh, the departed, uh, to, to honor the, the, their ancestors, uh, perhaps coming not just from the British Isles, but from other places in Northern Europe again. I happen to be a great fan of an archeology span series called Digging for Britain. 
which is on uh, TVO these days. And uh, there's wonderful stories where you actually see what the archeologists are doing and how do they come to their conclusions about uh, Stonehenge and other such monuments, um, such as this one here. There are literally dozens and dozens. They're not just in the British Isles, they're in Northern France and other places in Europe as well. So it, it's a kind of a vast cultural kind of thing. And following on that, one finds in particularly in um, the era of the early Christians, both uh, in the, the British Isles and, uh, and elsewhere, the tendency for churches to be oriented in an east-west uh, direction with the altar at the east end, and also burials to be uh, uh, oriented in this same way. And I see the archaeologists on Digging for Britain interpreting uh, burials according to how they're laid out and realizing that ones that look like this and are aligned in an east-west direction uh, probably represented early Christianity uh, within the British Isles, so back in the Anglo-Saxon period. Now, I talk about um, rising and setting, but actually latitude makes a big difference. So if you imagine uh, Canada, for instance, in the Arctic regions, the motions of the sky look more like this. The stars and sun and so forth are revolving around the uh, direction to the zenith, the point directly overhead. And if you go to the North Pole, then nothing rises and nothing sets. So uh, it's not surprising that the archaeoastronomy and high latitudes is very different. And there's this wonderful book called The Arctic Sky by John McDonald, published by the Royal Ontario Museum, that talks about Inuit astronomy, star lore, and legend, and how they use the sky and the rest of their environment, uh, both for navigation and uh, also for ritual. On the other hand, if you go to the tropics, if you go to the equator, for instance, the motions are quite different. And here the sun goes practically vertically out of the east as it rises and uh, sets vertic uh, almost vertically uh, in the west. And as long as you're between the tropics, between the Tropic of Capricorn and Tropic of Cancer, it's possible for the sun, at least at some times of the year, to be directly overhead, the so-called zenith passage, and therefore, if you have a vertical pole, it casts no shadow at that time. Or if you have a deep well, then the sun shines directly down into the well. And it turns out that this is a, a very significant event in uh, Mexican uh, myth and uh, lore, and also uh, elsewhere in Mesoamerica, Central America, and so forth, which are in the uh, which are between the tropics. One of those great cultures is the Mayans. And the Mayans were slightly unusual in that they were not only fascinated with time and the sun calendar, but they're also fascinated astrologically with the planet Venus, which is the second brightest object in the night sky. And so they had an elaborate calendar, not just for the sun, but also for Venus, which has a 260 year cycle. And uh, we now know that their calendars were extremely sophisticated. Now the problem is that they left behind lots of writings, but unfortunately the conquistadors uh, destroyed most of them. And now there's only a handful of uh, their writings, so-called uh, codices, which provide some details of uh, their knowledge. And this one, for instance, is just completely full of uh, information about astrology, astronomy, calendars, and Venus and so forth. So luckily we uh, at least have this left behind. You probably remember Mayan astronomy from December 21st, 2012. That was when the world was supposed to end, at least according to uh, some people's interpretation of the Venus calendar and the sun calendar as uh, coming to an end at exactly the same time. But it was really no different than if your car's odometer turns over from 99999 to 0000. 000, 000, 000, 000. Uh, your car doesn't self-construct, uh, destruct, I hope. Here's another famous uh, culture, the Aztecs in Peru, and they're famous for these markings on the plains of Nazca. Uh, 
And these cover huge areas of the plains. They're made simply by pushing aside the, the stones on the uh, desert floor and exposing the light colored sand. And you'll notice there's two kinds of things here. There's these figures of uh, insects and so forth. And there's also these lines. Now the question is, are those lines some kind of astronomical uh, alignment uh, or what? And so how are you supposed to see these huge figures? Uh, well, maybe they were only intended for the gods up in the sky. Actually, there are foothills close by where you or the elders could go up and uh, watch these. But as far as the alignments are concerned, they may have ritual significance, but they're probably not there to uh, give you a precise calendar uh, based on sunrises or sunsets. Now, that brings us to uh, possibly the most ludicrous uh, theories and possibly the most uh, uh, the, the ones that were uh, I've forgotten the word here. But anyway, uh, Eric von Daniken was languishing in a Swiss jail, uh, convicted embezzler and fraud, when he discovered that there was a more lucrative way of uh, making money and a, a more legal way of doing it. And so he wrote a number of breathless books and later turned into documentaries, which you can still see on cable TV on things called the Learning Channel, in which uh, many of these ancient uh, artifacts were simply ascribed to space aliens. So this previous one here, those lines were simply the landing strips for extraterrestrial spacecraft. And uh, of course, these figures were made so that the extraterrestrials would be able to see them from the sky. Now, the problem here is there's lots and lots of pseudoscience, in particular about archaeoastronomy. And no matter how well they're rebutted, uh, the pseudoscience sells and the rebuttals don't. Well, that brings us a little bit closer to home here, uh, because uh, we know that Canada's First Nations people uh, have used the sky as a clock, a compass, and a calendar. And um, in the Toronto area, there's been occupation for um, at least 10,000 years. So we can imagine that there's astronomy going on. So one feature of um, this culture is something called a medicine wheel, uh, which, which is shown at the bottom here. This may simply be a, a pattern of stones on a, a hilltop or a mountaintop, or it may actually represent the stones at the base of uh, a dwelling, a teepee or something like that. And uh, they tend to be oriented in a north, south, east, west way. And in fact, if you've ever gone to a, a ceremony which is opened by an elder, then they begin by acknowledging north, south, east, and west as being significant points within their environment. The most famous of these medicine wheels is in Wyoming, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel. Uh, it's up at about 10,000 feet. And there's a number of cairns here. And uh, at least one reputable astronomer has suggested that so there are alignments between these cairns towards the rising and setting point of the uh, sun or the moon or uh, significant planets or stars. Now, that's not widely accepted. Uh, but it's uh, not impossible, particularly since this is a sacred site, it would have ritual significance. Uh, there are several dozen of these medicine wheels in Western Canada. There's something called Canada Stonehenge, um, which is apparently completely dubious. It goes down to the rather ludicrous uh, end of the spectrum of, of uh, archeological work. Now, it turns out Toronto has a medicine wheel as well, as part of that uh, famous sign down at City Hall. Uh, this has been moved to somewhere else on uh, uh, the square in front of City Hall, as I understand. I haven't seen this since uh, then, um, but that's there in recognition of our First Nations people and uh, some of their beliefs. Now, it's interesting that in New Zealand, uh, the Maoris make up almost 10% of the population, so they get a little bit more clout than our First Nations people sometimes do. And uh, in their particular culture, the Pleiades, the star cluster, figures prominently both in terms of the season keeping and its use in navigation, and it's been adopted as their, the symbol of their new year. 
And so there's been efforts in New Zealand to try and establish uh, Matariki as uh, a, a real national holiday. I'm sad to say that this has not yet been successful, uh, but I know they're continuing to try. So here's another aspect of uh, archaeoastronomy, and that's simply the constellations in the sky. Uh, we have a set of 88 of them, same number as the keys on a piano, and these are all descended from Greco-Roman constellations, plus the southern constellations, which were named during the Industrial Revolution. So believe it or not, there's a constellation named after the air pump. But uh, there's nothing special about our constellation names or figures. So they're completely culturally determined. And uh, there's no reason why uh, constellations uh, uh, developed by First Nations or by the Maori or by Chinese uh, shouldn't be equally good. Here's a picture of a very nice artwork of some uh, traditional constellations from what we use. And so uh, remember, these constellations can be used by people to remember the stories uh, that were embedded in their particular cultures. And th this kind of reminds me of the stained glass windows in medieval cathedrals, which are there for basically the same purpose, to present the stories of the Bible, the stories of Jesus, in a way that everybody can see uh, whether they happen to be literate or not. Chinese constellations are a bit different. They're a bit smaller. Uh, I'm gonna mention those again in uh, just a few minutes uh, because they turn out to be very useful for uh, modern astronomy. I wanna uh, review a few astronomical phenomena that were certainly going to be significant for uh, pre-technological cultures. Simply the Milky Way itself, if you've ever seen the Milky Way under a clear dark sky, you realize that it needs some kind of explanation. And if you go to Wikipedia, for instance, you find literally two or three dozen stories from different cultures as to how they interpret the Milky Way. Uh, it seems that Milky Way comes uh, via the Egyptian ideas of the uh, nature of the Milky Way but there were ideas involving uh, uh, fields of wheat, migration of birds, a river in the sky, and so forth. Very much culturally connected. And then there's the Northern Lights, which we're familiar with here in Canada. Um, very technical explanation involving uh, energetic particles from the sun in our uh, upper atmosphere. So you can forgive pre-technological civilizations for not figuring that out. Um, but they have wonderful stories about how these connect with their cultures, particularly in the Inuit, in John MacDonald's book, and the Lapland cultures in Northern Europe. Uh, usually the explanations have something to do with uh, the spirits of the departed dancing around the sky, uh, producing these beautiful lights. Then there are comets. Uh, comets are just ice falls from the outer solar system. When they get close to the sun, uh, the ice evaporates, turns to gas, and then the sun's uh, light and radiation blow the tail away. But uh, for a few weeks here, you've got this very spectacular object in the sky looking very much like the finger of God. So it's not surprising that, predict particularly as they were unpredicted uh, by and large, they were regarded as uh, omens of disaster. There's this very famous example here uh, where the comet of uh, 1066, where, which was the year of the Norman invasion of uh, Britain, uh, came along and was obviously an omen of disaster for the British. Um, a good omen, however, for um, the, William the Conqueror and the Norman invaders. Eclipses of the moon happen uh, once or twice a year and can be seen over a, a wide area of the earth. When the moon goes into the earth's shadow, it tends to turn very dark and very red, the color of blood, for instance. And uh, there's one or two uh, quite well-known cases in classical times where uh, armies going into battle were so uh, in awe of the, this sudden eclipse of the moon that they decided that they'd call off the battle after all, which was uh, probably a good 
idea. Uh, similar stories about the eclipses of the sun, which are even more dramatic. Uh, they're much rarer in any particular place, but uh, once they happen, basically the day turns to night for a few minutes. And again, you can imagine how this is going to affect any civilization that doesn't have an understanding of this. They were regarded as having some meaning for them. Uh, the moon, of course, is um, quite significant. Uh, there's a famous little story from George Gamow, the physicist and science communicator, who asks, which is more useful, the sun or the moon? And the answer is obvious. The moon is more useful because it gives us light in the nighttime when it's dark, whereas the sun gives us light in the daytime when it's light anyway. Well, of course, the moon does give us light at night. Uh, this has been particularly important. Uh, the moon uh, is not a uniform white uh, ball. You'll see its surface here. Uh, here's the man in the moon that we refer to very often. But there are many stories in which the uh, figure on the moon is actually a rabbit. I know of no stories in which it's Lucy from uh, the Peanuts cartoon. Uh, but you can put your own interpretation on this because presumably many cultures, in fact, did that. The moon also goes around the Earth in a 29.5 day cycle of phases from new moon through full moon to uh, the last moon. Uh, it's interesting that uh, a lot of North American indigenous cultures had names for the different moons as they occurred during the year. The only one that stuck with us is Harvest Moon, which is the full moon closest to the autumnal equinox, which was a useful one because before the days of uh, artificial light, um, the moon was uh, very useful at that particular time uh, when you were bringing in the harvest. Now, the other thing about the lunar cycle is uh, its connection with calendars. There's a bit of information on this slide here, but the basic problem with calendars is that neither the length of the day nor the length of the month divides evenly into the length of the year. And so you have to figure out some scheme in order to uh, actually uh, resolve these three. In the case of the year, we have this complicated formula of uh, leap years, which gives us an average of 365.2422 days per year. But the moon is more difficult. So in the Islamic calendar, there's simply 12 moons and months in the year. Um, the Islamic uh, New Year cycles backwards in our calendar by about 11 days a year. Uh, our calendar is primarily solar in the sense that um, the uh, New Year and Christmas uh, both occur at about the date of the so uh, winter solstice. Uh, the Jewish calendar and uh, Chinese calendar are lunisolar. That is, they use both the uh, month and the, uh, the, the year uh, using either 12 or 13 months or alternating between the two, so as on average to uh, keep the new year at approximately the same time, either in September, October for the Jewish calendar or January, February for the Chinese one. So um, briefly, I want to uh, move up into more historic times to move towards more about cultural astronomy. Uh, I can't help showing you the picture of the Prague astronomical clock because it's uh, one of the wonders of the world as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's of medieval origin, so it dates back to when the Earth was at the center of the universe, but it shows you every possible thing that you need to know about the time or the time of the year, the signs of the zodiac and so forth. And even these figures up in the uh, left or the right and the left here, uh, which give you moral lessons about uh, what to do if you want to go to heaven and not go to hell. I mentioned Chinese astronomy earlier. It dates back uh, at least 5,000 years. Luckily, they kept lots of records about their uh, work in uh, maintaining a good calendar, but also about looking for unexpected sky events as possible omens. So this would include eclipses, it would include comets, it would e include uh, exploding stars. 
And so the records would say which of these little constellations did it occur in and when did it occur? And now astronomers can refer back to those either to detect uh, periodic reappearances of comets or for instance, uh, when did this exploding star uh, resulting in the Crab Nebula explode? Well, it was observed in 1054 by Chinese astronomers. So we know exactly how long this nebula has been expanding from its explosion, uh, namely about a thousand years. Indian astronomy, uh, primarily astrological, but in so doing, contributing uh, some important tools to uh, astronomy on which other astronomies built, uh, contributions to mathematics, and uh, these wonderful observatories. If you happen ever to have been to Delhi or to uh, uh, Jaipur, places like that, um, these date back uh, several centuries. One of the most important things about Indian and Chinese and Islamic astronomy is that there was actually communication between them uh, through the Silk Road and various other trade routes. So scholars moved back and forth and they shared information. And of course, that's one of the essential things about science is sharing information between uh, one scientist and another. Islamic astronomy went through a golden age for about a thousand years after the decline of the Roman Empire and before the Copernican Revolution. So Islamic astronomers not only translated and preserved uh, existing knowledge, important books from classical times, but they continued the observations of people like Hipparchus and so forth, uh, culminating in the work that uh, Copernicus and others could build on, they developed the mathematics that was needed for calculations like this. And there's this wonderful observatory in Samarkand built by Ulrich Beg, and uh, only a bit of the remains of this uh, are still around, but it was certainly the most impressive observatory up to the time of Tycho Brahe around uh, 1600. So uh, a marvelous, uh, uh, marvelous uh, construction. And as you may know, uh, most star names are from the Arabic. Um, here, if you want them, are the names of the seven stars in the, uh, in the, in the Big Dipper. Now, you might wonder, well, what's left to be done in archaeoastronomy? Well, the answer is a heck of a lot. First of all, I've uh, indicated many things that are very uncertain. Uh, certainly we don't have a definitive idea as to the nature and use of, uh, of many of these structures that I've been telling you about, but there's whole areas in which we've yet to fully understand important civilizations. And one example is simply Africa. So there's both Saharan and Sub-Saharan uh, uh, civilizations, which are only now being <clears throat> fully appreciated, partly through the efforts of uh, African astronomers and partly through the work of people like um, Black historian Henry Louis Gates uh, in the United States. So uh, certainly there's a need to excavate uh, uh, sites like this. Uh, one of the neat things about archaeology that I've been able to observe in digging for Britain is the important role that student labor plays and amateur labor plays in doing these kind of things. So it's certainly things that uh, people are interested in. And lest you think that these pre-technological civilizations are really stupid, uh, let me share a few statistics from today. Uh, over a third of Americans believe in astrology, despite the lack of any scientific basis. Over a third of Americans believe that space aliens have landed. Over a third of Americans believe in young Earth creationism. That is, the whole universe is only a few thousand years old. And very few Canadians or Americans understand the cause of the seasons. That is, that it isn't due to the Earth being closer to the sun or further away. Uh, it's due to these motions that I showed you earlier on. So I want to end by asking this question, why does all this matter? And try and answer it in a couple of sentences. And I think it matters because we have to remember that astronomy, like all the sciences, is done within a culture. 
Um, there's a little culture of professional astronomers, but it exists within a number of cultures that uh, exist uh, in our own country here. And those cultures have their own history, their own interests, their own beliefs, their own needs. And I think we do a better job of educating and doing public outreach if we can realize that we're operating within this uh, very interesting multicultural environment. So I always like to end my presentations with this uh, Gary Larson slide here. Mr. Osborne, maybe I be excused, my brain is full. I hope your brains are full now, but more to the point, I hope you have interesting things to think about. Um, in summary here, uh, I hope I've convinced you that so many cultures involved in engage in sky watching for many reasons. They devoted great effort to building pyramids and stone hinges and things like that. We have much knowledge that's incomplete or lost completely because of the neglect of uh, some of our smaller cultures in the world. And to do anything really requires an interdisciplinary approach. I'll leave this up for a minute because if you go to my website here, there's a version of this talk, uh, which you can find at this particular URL here. And uh, now we've used our 50 minutes and I'm looking forward to your questions. Mike? <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, John. Uh, that was fantastic and provoked a lot of really interesting discussion in the comments. Already. So uh, I'm gonna relay some questions to you. And um, we'll start with Katrina Olson, who asked early on in the talk, uh, using astronomy in cross-curricular programs, some students will say that there's no point in talking about space because they're never going to go to space. How do you respond to those students? Well, simply because astronomy has been part of so many cultures and that every culture has not only used astronomy, but shown a very great interest in these deeper parts of our discipline, the idea of how the uh, universe originated, how did life originate within it, and so forth. Is that a reasonable answer, or have I missed the question? <laughs> well, I, we can, I guess uh, it's reasonable to me, but we'll see if Katrina is satisfied. She can do a follow-up if she likes. Okay. Um, so another from uh, Ben Callis. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, were the Maya using the Zenith passage with their it says C note sinkholes for observation. I'm not sure if you, I don't know what that means, but perhaps you can. I honestly don't know. Um, much of it would be done through uh, risings and settings because that's uh, an easier way to be able to measure cycles. You do actually have to have a reasonably good clock to do this, and apparently they did. So I'm not aware of the Zenith passages. Most of what I've learned about Zenith passages is for my colleague, Julieta Fierro in Mexico, who's the kind of Carl Sagan of, of uh, Mexico and uh, knows a lot about this kind of thing. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, Margaret Unger asks, so the Nazca lines can be viewed from nearby hills? They can, yes. There are foothills in the vicinity and then there's the question in terms of the figures that have been etched into uh, the soil, uh, whether it's necessary for humans to actually see them or whether they are simply there for viewing by the gods. But there are foothills nearby where uh, you can go up and uh, it's traditional in many different cultures, uh, certainly the medicine wheels in the Western Canada, and the, the one that I showed you, for elders to go up to the top of hills. Of course, we, 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 we keep that on in the cartoons where you climb up this steep hill at the top of a mountain and you find some sort of guru who will give you wisdom. But uh, I suppose it's a matter of wanting to be as close to the gods as possible. But that was, for instance, what the Bighorn Medicine Wheel was used for. The elders went up to the top of that as soon as the uh, snow melted and they could get up there in May and June and so forth. Okay, thank you. So uh, Reykjavik0525 asks, what did early civilizations think eclipses were? Uh, 
I don't know for every single one, but I mean, I should say at this point that the Greeks had figured out all of the geometry of the uh, Earth, Moon, Sun system. So for them, it was, it was completely obvious as to why the moon was going into eclipse. In fact, one of the things that they noticed was that the shadow of the Earth on the moon was round. And so that was an obvious piece of information that the Earth was, uh, was round. It was a sphere. Uh, I'm less certain about every other culture. Uh, and in particular, it would cha change during time. I suspect with the Chinese culture, for instance, that early on, they may not have appreciated that, but by the time they were calculating accurate calendars to be able to predict these, uh, they would have to know uh, what it was that they were predicting. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so uh, Jabir Babayev asks, I'm gonna interpret this a bit, but I think the question is uh, for the 1050, in 1054 AD, was the Crab Nebula observed at that time or did it form at that time? Um, yeah, I need to clarify this because what we're talking about here is something called a supernova. Now a supernova is the explosion of a very massive star, which at the end of its life, its core collapses, releasing huge amounts of gravitational energy that basically expand and explode the outer part of the star. The star becomes extremely bright. And in a few cases, including that particular supernova, it was actually uh, visible during the daytime. And so for a few months, you could see this uh, new star in the sky, and then it gradually disappeared. Uh, a thousand years later, we can observe at that particular point, this expanding nebula. And in fact, you can take the uh, take images over a period of time and actually see the expansion and project it back to the time that it was formed in uh, 1054. Uh, some of the first of that was done at the David Dunlap Observatory at the University of Toronto um, by Sidney Vandenberg and Carl Camper. I didn't know that, that's amazing. So we have a, a related question from Sharman, which is, uh, when and where was the first depiction of a supernova found and what was it recorded as? Um, that's a question that I don't know the answer to, but I know the answer to a version of it. Because for quite a while, there was a claim that uh, in one of the uh, uh, southwestern uh, native sites, there was a diagram on the wall which was interpreted to represent the uh, supernova that produced the Crab Nebula. And there was an image as well of the moon. That has been pretty much uh, downplayed and it's no longer accepted as such. So uh, not that one there. Uh, I'm not aware of any Egyptian recordings of the, uh, that supernova. I might inject that there was a remarkable discovery that I found out about a few years ago, in which it turned out that the Egyptians apparently were able to monitor the changing brightness of a very famous variable star called Algol, uh, which is an eclipsing binary star. And uh, I, I actually couldn't believe it. I was actually consulted to find a, a referee for a journal paper. Mm. And eventually we found referees and they said, yeah, this is uh, uh, a legitimate thing. That doesn't answer the question because I, I don't know a complete answer to the question. That's okay. Um, so two related, related to one another question. So Reykjavik0525 asks, can you provide some recommendations for further reading on the subject? I think just general archaeoastronomy. And Vineet Honkin asks, uh, do you know of any books that discuss Hindu astronomical mythologies? Well, so books in general here. I, I'm going to give a very naughty answer, and that is go to Wikipedia. <laughs> now, it's just incredible how much interesting and, and generally uh, accurate information there is on Wikipedia. Uh, a, you can go there and you can go from link to link to link and it just opens up a huge world of information and just gets you so impressed with 
how much information has been generated about uh, these sites and dozens and dozens of other ones. There's a complete list there of archaeoastronomically significant sites in different uh, countries around the world. So uh, on one hand, there's that. Uh, if you want technical stuff, it turns out that there's an important archaeoastronomy conference called the Oxford Conference that happens every two years. And if you're a more scholarly person, you can track down the, uh, the uh, uh, proceedings of the uh, Oxford, uh, the Oxford uh, conferences. It comes in two volumes, Old World and New World, because the two are quite different in terms of the techniques that are used. Uh, one's having to do with Egypt and Stonehenge and so forth. Um, they're very much archeological, whereas the New World ones have a lot more anthropology and ethnography to them. One slide that I somehow uh, must have hidden on this presentation was uh, about sites in the Southwestern US uh, very much like the Newgrange site where the sun on the first day of summer, fall, winter, and spring uh, shines into a cave and illuminates uh, uh, a little spiral there. And there are several other ones that are similar, which gives some credence to the fact that this is actually real. Fascinating. Uh, I think this is our last question. If uh, anyone else has other questions, please type them into the chat. Uh, right away so that we can uh, try and get to them. Uh, but the last yeah, question I'll I have here, recorded I'll, here. I'll be here for several more weeks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll, uh, yeah, our last question is from VG Murdoch. When stars explode, do the constellations change? Um, they do temporarily. They do temporarily because if the star does brighten so that it's as bright as the naked eye stars, then one, one sees a, a change. I should say there are two kinds of stars that do this. There are supernovae, but as you might suspect, there are also novae. Uh, novae are much more frequent and much less violent, um, but uh, they can often be seen. And there's an interesting story. I'm not sure whether my daughter's still online or not, uh, or she's going to watch it when she uh, uh, when she uh, gets out of another meeting. But I remember that one summer she was at camp, and uh, it was the summer that there was a nova in the constellation Cygnus, which significantly affected the appearance of the constellation. Well, she apparently knew the constellations well enough to be a, essentially a, an independent discoverer of it along with thousands of other people. And I actually hadn't heard about it yet. <laughs> so in that case, it, it certainly did. And there are other supernovae which have plays, played very important roles in the history of astronomy. There was one discovered uh, by Tycho Brahe and another discovered by Kepler at the time of the Copernican revolution. And uh, they overturned the idea that everything in the sky was uh, unchanging. That was that goes back to Aristotle's time. So it provided proof that there was something wrong with the old ideas of uh, the way the universe was arranged. And so it did make a significant contribution to the development of our present understanding of the solar system and the universe. Wonderful. So there's there's one last question uh, people are, are talking about in the comments. And uh, again, apologies if I mess up the name, but I think it's uh, Janess E. James. Going back to the emergence of the Crab Nebula, our observation of it was in 1054, but when did it actually take place? Well, it would have taken place uh, many hundreds or thousands of years earlier. I cannot offhand remember what the distance of the Crab Nebula is. Uh, probably other people could, I could certainly look it up. But if the distance, for instance, is a thousand light years, then uh, it actually happened a thousand years before when it was observed because it took that, that long for the light to uh, reach us. Okay, so we'll do one last question. And this one sure. is from Virgil Chung. Uh, and he says, uh, since constellations and stars rotate around the galaxy, will the North Star no longer be pointing to North after several million years? 
Uh, well, it's going to be faster than that. And that's a really good question for a number of reasons. And it depends on the fact that the Earth's uh, axis of rotation gradually precesses like a top in a period of 26,000 years. So if I could hold up my finger like this, it does a sort of cone-shaped pattern so that right now the uh, axis is pointing close to the star Polaris, but in a few thousand years, it won't be. And one of the applications of that is the supposed orientation of the Great Pyramid in Egypt, um, which is oriented north, south, east, west, but there's a passageway that supposedly um, pointed to the pole star at that time, which was the star Thuban. So uh, at a, a certain time in the future, Vega is going to be the pole star. So uh, it's a lot shorter period of time than the time it takes the sun to go around the galaxy. Uh, basically, because the stars are so far away, even though they're moving fairly fast, the constellations stay pretty much the same for uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. You have to go for millions of years before their individual motions um, cause them to change. Okay, well, wonderful. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Thank you. I, there have been lots of thanks uh, sent to you, including from your colleague Jim Hesser and Victoria oh, wow. uh, in the chat. <laughs> lots of people thanking you and really appreciating Bye, your Jim. talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very, very much. We're going to end there, folks. But if you're interested in tonight's presentation and in more like it, please follow the Dunlap Institute on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, you can also go on our website to find the schedule for upcoming Cosmos most from your couch talks, which we will be doing for the duration of kind of the world average lockdown, we hope. So stay safe, everybody. Have a good night, and we'll see you again for the next one.